when we when we go left or right, we, we readjust to, to this uh, foundation. This is what we are trying to do. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So this morning, let me show you the title of the message. And you will see it. You will be so excited by the title. It's coming just... Uh, it's coming, it's coming, it's, 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 it's almost there, it's coming, it's coming, yes. Fulfill your dream. Wow, fulfill your dream. This is something that is so wonderful, people like to hear. Fulfill your dream, fulfill your potential, follow your heart. Yes, but is it really the highest goal that God has for us here today? What about the next 25 years of your life? Is that what God wants you to do? Fulfill your dream? Is it why Jesus died for you? To fulfill your dream? Is it the reason why the Holy Spirit who lives in us is helping us to fulfill our dream? Is it? Let's click for the real title of the message today. Yes, we change titles. Fulfill God's purpose. Is that better than the first one? Yes. It's more realistic. But how can you and I find, follow, and fulfill God's purpose? I've been asking myself this week as I was praying and preparing, how can I answer this question simply and clearly? And in fact, I was so blessed in the retreat because that has been answered so clearly by our missionaries. How can we find, follow and fulfill? Their life is an illustration of how to fulfill God's principle. So as I prayed, uh, I think on Friday morning, it came clear to me, God should be, look at the people I'm using in my word. Look at the great uh, people of, of the Bible that you all know so much. So this morning, I'm not going to announce anything new, anything fancy. It's very simple. Let's look together at some of the great men and maybe women of the Bible and see what, how God has succeeded to lead them into fulfilling uh, their, uh, their, uh, the, the purpose of God. Jeremiah is first. And somebody of the missionary yesterday talked about him. Before you were born... Before you were born, God speaking to you this morning, before you were born, I set you apart. There is a purpose. There is a purpose for you. I don't know if you have ever realized it even as you were young, but I remember when I was in primary school, at some point God had touched my heart. I remember two occasions where God had put something. But then after that, I w walked away from that. A little bit like Pastor Renalien was sharing. She, God put something in her heart. Then she went on living her life. And later on, God brought it back into her life. Jeremiah, he was young. He was insecure. He didn't think much about himself. He probably had other plans for his life. Just like all of us, we have plans for our lives. We have dreams. We, we want to do, when I turned 50, oh, Bridget, when we turned 50, we wanted to go to Paris, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> but we didn't go, and I'm 63. <laughs> okay, after I graduate, I want to do this, I want to do that. You know, after I get married, I want this and I want that. Okay, so dreams we have. But the Lord says, don't say I'm too young, for you must go. You must say, and don't be afraid. What you and I need this morning, if we want to fulfill God's word, is the Lord to touch our mouth. Look at the last verse there. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth. When it says this expression, I touch my mouth, it's not only the mouth. I think he touched much more than the mouth. He had to touch the heart and touch the mouth as well. Because, you know, many of us, we are afraid. We don't dare to speak the truth, the beautiful message of the gospel. But God says, let me touch your mouth. Let me enable you. Let me do make a difference in you. So what you need is an experience with God. Uh, before God touched his mouth, he was so insecure. Is that right? How many of you are insecure this morning when it comes to fulfilling big plans for God? We don't know where to start. We don't know what to say. We feel so insignificant. But God can do it for you this morning. He can do touching much more than your, your mouth. First, God must call you. Second, God puts you in a church. That's where God will 
uh, mean to equip your mouth for the ministry. And you have seen in the video last week, uh, the, the church, the life of the church, you know, all the foundation class and all of these has been the foundation has been established in the church. This is the ministry of Lighthouse. And I want to say this, I think, and I'm speaking for Pastor Jennifer as well. The same care that our missionaries and people who were here and some of you from the beginning had received in Lighthouse, we are committed to provide the same care in the same ministry, the same foundation to all of you, to equip you for the ministry. Then you need to experience, you have your own experience with the Holy Spirit. Until Jeremiah had his own experience with God, he was just, I'm too young, I'm, I don't know, I, I cannot do that. So you need to have that very much. And realize something, after God touched his mouth, and more than his mouth, some of the most wonderful promise of the Word of God that you quote all the time comes from Jeremiah. Can you think of the most popular one that we quote all the time? I have a plan for you, yes. It comes from the guy who says, I cannot speak, I'm too young. I, I, I. You know, God says, I don't, I, you go and you must see what I, I, will, I, will, I will do to you. And then another one says, if you seek me, this is one of my favorite ones, if you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. I will let you find me. Another one wonderful, Jeremiah, it, call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things, things that you didn't know. This comes from this young man, says, I don't know, I don't know. You know, and we are inspired, but God did something. You and I is the same thing. We feel young, inadequate, but when God touch your mouth, when God says go, we can, we can go and we, we can continue. Isaiah, you know Isaiah had a great vision before the Lord. Hallelujah. He had a great, great vision. And then he felt so scared. It's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips. And God used calls to touch his lips and to remove his sins. Your sins are forgiven. And the Lord later asked, whom should I send as a messenger to these people? Who will go for us? I am. Send me. He said, at first he says, no, I'm dead. You know, because of the holiness of God. And you know, this is something uh, a, a bit uh, normal. When Pastor Vivian shared yesterday, she says, when uh, she realized that God called her to be a pastor, she says, oh, I must not sin. <laughs> I must clean up my life. I must walk, walk in the light. So there's a, a sense of reverence. There's a sense of purity. There's a sense of who I represent when, when you want to, to serve God. How many times myself, when I, when I started in the ministry, when I was saved, why ch you chose me? I was the worst. In my family, you know, maybe you feel, if you feel impure, unfit, you know, sinful before the Lord or something, you don't feel something is, is, is right. But realize something this morning, it is God's work that sanctifies you. It's not you, it's not your goodness. We are not saved by our goodness. We are saved because God purifies, God saves, God transforms, God sanctifies, God calls and sets you apart. So Isaiah learned that from a man who felt totally unfit, he felt filthy. You find that the book of Isaiah is called the Gospel of the Old Testament. He talks more than any other people before him and after him about the role, the works of the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 7, a virgin will give birth to a child. Isaiah chapter 9, a son has been given and the government will be on his shoulder. Isaiah 35, describing and details the ministry and the works of the Messiah. Isaiah 53, the wonderful picture of Jesus on the cross saving us. He has taken our sin, he has taken our sicknesses upon us. Isaiah 61, giving us a picture of being with the new kingdom, the new Jerusalem and all of these things. And Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 when he began his ministry that he is coming to set the captives free, to open the prison door, to, to call a year of jubilee.
It is God's work that sanctifies you and me and makes us fit to find and follow and fulfill his work. Gideon, one of the wonderful characters of the Bible, Gideon. Gideon was hiding from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord calls him mighty hero. The Lord is with you. Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why this trouble? Why are all the miracles? And the Lord said, go, go. But I can't. My family is poor. My family is the weakest. We are not a family of influence in the community. We are nobody. And me, I'm not even important in my own family. And the Lord says, I will be with you. God saw a hero in Gideon. When God looks at you, what does he see? Ah, yeah, you don't dare to say it. Say it with me. God sees a hero. God sees a hero. When God looks at me, God sees a hero. When God looks at you, God sees a hero. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? I see a hero. Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. Gideon only saw his social status. He saw his poverty. He saw his background. You know, I, I come from a poor family. And my mother was a, a hairdresser. She was only primary school educated. Three children, no husband. I grew, I, I knew what it is to, to be poor and feel unimportant in the village. You know, this is how many of us are in, the, from this, in this room here. And he's questioning God. How can my situation change? You know, what can change in my life anyway? So we many times repeat the circle of poverty. We just repeat what our parents have done. We, just, we are in a circle of sinfulness and non-achievement or something like that. The, he's questioning, where are the miracles of the Bible? Where are the miracles? And I know that you and I, we have asked these questions many times. We have prayed, and we wonder where are the great miracles of, of God. When we have not yet experienced the miraculous of God, we only focus on the reality of our problems, on the smallness of our lives, on our inadequacies. And this is Gideon. The trouble was real. Is the trouble of your life real? Yes. yes. But can God change that? Yes, but if you have not experienced the miraculous in your life, you, you question, where are the miracles? How can it be changed? And then you just continue focusing on your, on your trouble and on your smallness. Have you ever asked yourself a similar question? And until you are willing to trust God in your life and stepping on faith, you will not be able to move out of your problem of seeing only your problems. You know, when I remember when I was called by God, with audible voice to move four children from Canada to Hong Kong. I said, no, it's not possible. Because I look at my social status, I look at my bank account, I look at the number of children, I look at the whatever there, there was, the cost of living in Hong Kong. And I said, no, I cannot see it happening. How can it happen? And you know, I experienced the touch of God on that day. God spoke audible voice. I heard it and very clearly and I remember it and you have heard, many of you have heard me say that. God says, have you heard what you just said? No, I can't. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot for this reason. I cannot for that reason. And then God said to me, you just confess your faith in me. Your faith in me is I cannot. I cannot do this. I cannot. It's the faith that I have with God. And then I repented. I remember I repented. And I said, okay, God, if it is you speaking to me to move to Hong Kong, it's a big responsibility, then do something. I ask God for a miracle. And that's, that's what we are reading here. Where are the great miracles? I ask God for a miracle in the areas of finance because I couldn't move without that. And God did it. I'm here today, 25 years Yes, praise the Lord. God did a miracle. The Lord says, go. I am sending you. I will be with you. God sees the hero in you. When God called Peter, he saw a rock. You are the rock. You will be the rock. And he saw that. King David. David was young. He was not tall. And he was not, definitely not built to be a soldier. Because when he tried the armor, it was too big for him. 
Okay, so I can identify with that. <laughs> he was considered only good to tend the sheep and deliver sandwiches. That's his job. His own family did not consider him fit for any important role, but God made something very clear and he's doing it for you and for me. When there was a selection for the new king, his seven, the seven uh, siblings came. Big guys, you know, muscular, athletic guy came. And the Lord says, do not consider his appearance, the big brother, the strong brother, or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And he looks at your heart. Do you have a heart? If God, God has your heart, he can do great things. For, he can do anything. But if he doesn't have your heart, he cannot do uh, anything. What do you think of your outward appearance? When you look at yourself in the mirror this morning, do you like yourself? Do you like your nose, your eyes, the color of your hair, your size? Do you, like, do you have a low self-image? You know, it doesn't really matter what you look like. The Lord does not look like men look. He look at the heart. And you know, it is proven that most people don't like what they see in the mirror. They don't like their nose, they don't like something, there's something here, there's something there, there's a, some imperfection, too tall, too skinny, too fat, too, too, too like big feet, small feet, you know. People don't like themselves. But you know, change, change that. When it comes to fulfilling the purpose of your life and God's will, God doesn't care about size. He just cares. Remember the testimony of Pastor Arena yesterday when she went to the government to register the church and obtain her license for marriage? All they could see is her size and her looking young. They couldn't see the pastor inside of her. But she is a pastor and she has a marriage license and the church is registered. What did God see when God looks at Pastor Renalin? He sees, he sees the woman of God that she is. Acts 13, 22. A man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. That's what God is looking. You want to fulfill? You want to serve God's purpose in your time? God's looking for your heart. Can, can God see that of me and of you? He will do, she will do everything that I want them to. I hope we can say yes, but unfortunately, I know that most of us will say no to that because that's the reality. There's a lot of things we're not willing to do. There's a lot of things we're not willing to. Even, I, I don't want to condemn anybody, but just a simple things. Okay, we have a special meeting Sunday afternoon, come Sunday afternoon. Oh, no, no, me, I'm only going Sunday morning. That's just a small thing. Forget about what I said. <laughs> don't come, don't come this afternoon. In your heart, are you willing to do what is pleasing to the Lord? Everything he wants you to do. If yes, you can defeat Goliath. Hey, that's a big deal. How many Goliath have you ever defeated? You can defeat Goliath if you can say, if God can say that of you, he, I, 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 he is, his heart is pleasing me. He will do everything I'm asking him to do. Moses was mentioned yesterday, so I will go uh, quickly over that for, for that. But, but one thing about Moses I want to bring, it's about the mistakes. He had a great start in life. He was raised in the palace by a princess. That's wonderful. How many of you would like to live in the, in the, with a princess? I like to live with a princess. My mother was not a princess. She was a hairdresser. Okay. <laughs> he experienced tremendous sense of failure. And one thing that's very important for us this morning, some mistakes that we make cause more damaging consequences, long-lasting, life-wasting uh, decisions. Example, you are at a university and you get pregnant. You cannot quit, you, you quit your studies, take care of the baby. That's a life-changing, dramatic event. Uh, you are put in stupid, uh, uh, you are, no, sorry. <laughs> because of a stupid youth mistake, you are put in jail. And then you have a criminal record for the rest of your life. 
that is life changing. You're driving while texting and you have an accident or you run over somebody or you're driving o under the influence and you run over somebody. This is like it takes only a second. You know, you, everybody can drive and text at the same time. Everybody can do that. But it takes just one time that you do that. The consequences of our mistakes are not all the same. You can do certain type of mistakes. It's not a big deal. Tomorrow your life is, remains the same. But some mistakes are life damaging. Long time and very, very dramatic. Moses' mistake cost him 80 years. From the palace, he ended up living in a cave with the sheep. For 80 years later, he could fulfill God's purpose. That's, that's quite serious, I would say. Don't you think so? Yes? No, you don't think so? Yes, you think so? Yes. Okay. Only that side thinks so. This side, they, they're still thinking about it. You know, Brother Andrew Chan from Wuhan? You know, he was many, many years in heroin. He, he damaged his life, his health, but God redeemed him. And he is serving God today. Many of us have made mistakes that influence our future negatively, influence our emotions negatively. It takes away our innocence. It takes away our self-confidence. And then we come looking at God's plan for our life and we feel so unable to. We feel so pervert or we feel so broken so that we cannot do that. But God made Moses the greatest man. And Israel, they, they only swear by Moses. Moses becomes the foundation of the New Testament by his, by his life. Let's talk about the grumpy prophet. Jonah. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked they are. Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Wow, what a good prophet. I want to follow God's will. <laughs> oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. <laughs> God wants me to go this way. I'm going in and this way. And, you know, th this, is, this is so, such a picture of us. This is such a picture of us. Jonah didn't have a compassionate heart. Not every Christian has a compassionate heart. Not everybody feels what God feels agrees with it and are touch and cry or are moved. Not everybody have the same level of compassion to, to move the kingdom of God uh, to, uh, and, and actions. He didn't seem to care for people. That's why he ran in the opposite uh, direction. And he says, to get away from the Lord. You know, he says, hey, I want the Lord. Lord bless me. Lord bless me. But if the Lord asks me something, maybe I'm more inclined to run in the opposite direction. Have you ever done that or felt like this? You know, I, I, it's not for condemning us. You know, I think God gave us this story of Jonah so that you and I, that together we can see something about ourselves. How our human emotions work without the transformation of the Holy Spirit. Without the transformation of the Holy Spirit, you and I, we are just like Jonah. We, we, that, that's all we can do. We, we cannot do better, better than Jonah. We need the transformation of the Holy Spirit. When the church calls, okay then, I'll do it, even if I don't want to. Uh, grudgingly, or others will say, no way, I'm not moving, I'm not doing it, I'm not lifting my finger. Hey, what we're talking about here is fulfilling God's purpose. It requires sacrifice, letting go of something, going out of our way, doing the extra mile. The Great Commission is so, so important. And one thing that is very encouraging in the story of Jonah is that Jonah did it grudgingly. Okay, he had no compassion, but he did it because he was kind of forced by, uh, to that by God. But w listen to that; it's very important. While he was doing it grudgingly, that's when gradually he got God's heart. It is the story finished well. God teach him a lesson. He learned what he should have learned a long time ago. It took him a long time. It was difficult for him. But at the end, God explained to him. says, listen, you care for yourself. You're angry about this little plant that died, but you are not moved by, because 120 people will die under the condemnation of God. He, he got the lesson. So sometimes, here is my advice. 
Even though you are obeying grudgingly, obey. And while you are obeying, the Holy Spirit will stir up something and then you will be able to move and get God's heart finally. Understand what God wants you to understand. Have the, the, the vision of the Lord in this. Let me finish quickly with Esther because she is so worthy to be mentioned this morning. Esther, beautiful woman. I hope I will see, not I hope, I'm looking forward to meet Esther in heaven. Hallelujah. What a beautiful story of courage. You know, Esther, she could have easily excused herself for many reasons. I'm a woman. This is a man's world that time, okay? This is a monarchy. She's ma forced to marry to the king. If, if the king doesn't put his specter, scepter, <laughs> come, if you go there, you die. So she could have excused herself when the situation came. I have climbed the social ladder. She was from the upper class now. She had succeeded. She was not a little Jewish slave. She was a, a queen. She was of the, you know, upper class people don't like to dirty their hands. They don't like to do manual uh, tasks. Now they have achieved, you know. It's hard. It's hard to do something that requires commitment and something dangerous. And then she's thinking, I cannot get involved. I cannot change the law. The law is already passed. It's already stamped. The Jewish are going to be put to death. I, I cannot do that. Then she came to believe in something. She believed that if we fast, something can change. God can do something. Wow, that's powerful. They fasted for three days. Through this fast, God gave her an extraordinary wisdom. A super wisdom. When you look at this, this book, it's like, wow, wow. This, 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 this whole thing was all organized. They were the, 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 the big uh, place where they would hang. Uh, Mordecai was already there. Everything was done. And then one day, the whole world changed. The law of the land changed. People were being rescued because a woman said, if we can fast, I believe God can do something. And God gave her like an insight how to deal, how to approach the king, how to present her case, and how to present. And the, the result is that the law of the land has been changed and God's plan was fulfilled. Do you remember years ago when Judge Barbara Chan came and gave us her testimony here? How before like big court case here in Hong Kong, they would pray and bind the spirit and you know, go against evil and, 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 and everything. We can't say anything, but she did pray and she did make a difference. You remember our brother Larry O'Malley? who is visiting here every year, once or twice a year. Larry O'Malley has been fasting every week for years and years and years. He's been fasting every day. He's been fasting lunch. He fasts and he believes that God's going to move. How can people find God's will? How can you fulfill God's purpose? All of these heroes that we have looked at this morning were very ordinary before the experience with God. Their problem is identical to your problem. The way they look at, at, our, at themselves before, it's identical to how you look at yourself and how I look at myself. And without the miraculous touch of God, there's no change. But with God, by faith, Hebrew 11, by faith, by faith, by trusting God, by faith, by trusting God. There's two kinds of faith. There's the faith belief, agreeing. And I think many people, after years of being Christian, there's a difference between a baby Christian and a mature Christian. Baby Christian believes and pray for an apartment, for, for a job, for pray for, like a baby prays. And God does it. I remember the first prayer that we did, Bridget and I, we prayed for an apartment. We were told pretty precise how much we pray, how many bedrooms, already furnished, uh, and, and this is, this is that. And it happened within one week. That's, that was our first prayer for, for our family need. Wow, so powerful. And after that, when we got uh, grown up, it's like our faith become disengaged. 
more like a passive faith instead of an active and engaged and committed faith. And that is the very big danger. So we come to 25 years of our life. Where are you in finding, following, and fulfilling God's will? Looking at how you started, now you are midpoint, and now you're going ahead. How is your faith? Passive or engaged? It's time to change. It's time to turn around and think of the miraculous and let God be God into your life. Amen? Amen. Let's celebrate this wonderful anniversary thinking that ordinary people with ordinary human problems identical to ours can make such a big, big, big difference. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What are we...